Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Welcome to the latest episode of Masters of Carpentry, a John Carpenter fan cast. Is that the right word? I always feel weird when I say that. I was using fan cast because there's those podcast patent trolls. Oh, uh, I see. Okay. We're a podcast, unless you want to sue us, in which case we're a fan cast. Yeah, we're not a podcast. We're just a self-help seminar. <laughs> Where we discuss John Carpenter and John Carpenter films, going chronologically, starting from his student film, The Resurrection of Bronco Billy, going all the way to the ward and beyond, question mark? Hopefully. Today, we will be discussing a very scary movie. Not really. It's Memoirs of an Invisible Man. Yes. But before we get to that, why don't we just introduce who all is here? Oh yeah, that's a good point. See, I told you I got really good at it. Joining me is my co-host, the lovely, beautiful person I'm very much in love with, Noel. Oh. <laughs> Just imagine me resting my head on your shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> also joining me is someone from the United States, Julia. Hey, what's up? Go America. Julia, my head was nowhere near your husband's shoulder. You better not be Noel. <laughs> I know your address. And joining us, very special guest, is Evie. Evie, please tell us about yourself. I fought a bear once. It ended poorly for the bear. I was going to say, for who? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously for the bear. Of course. So yes, Evie, for those who may not have been with us in the past, is my old co-host for my Hate Love Remakes, my first podcast series. Yay! It's been so long. I, which I listen to every episode. Your fan cast series, in case someone's listening and my wants to... My fan cast series. Yes. <laughs> my recast series for remakes. Your audio <laughs> webinar. <laughs> So yes, it's been far too long since I've done a show with Evie, and we have her back. That's right, back again for the first time. For this, because apparently you hate me. Well, we almost <laughs> had you back for a Philadelphia experiment, but it's probably a good thing that you weren't. Was it that bad? You would have hated it. Touche. As Alex mentioned, we are here to discuss Memoirs of an Invisible Man. Before this project, is this a film that any of us had ever seen before? No. Yes. I'd heard of it? Question so wait, mark? Wait, 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 wait. Julia, you said yes? Yes, I have seen this movie before, Noel. Oh my god, we found one. I know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it starred Chevy Chase and Daryl Hannah and was made in the 80s. I've seen it. <laughs> made in the 90s. 90s. Sorry. Whatevs. <laughs> Gray zone. Gray zone. <laughs> but it looks like the 80s. It feels like the 80s. It was in my time. <laughs> yeah. The blockbuster years. But still, do you remember where you where and when you had seen it? I know I was a kid, so it must have been I mean, not in the theater or anything, whenever it was released on beta or VHS mm -hmm. for rental and was rented by my parents <laughs> and watched by me. I heard of it. I thought it was a comedy and I didn't know that it was directed by John Carpenter. And Julia, I'm guessing you didn't know that it was directed by John at the time. Oh, no, not at all. This also is just one that I'd never seen before. The first I had heard of it was when I was looking up the works of William Goldman. I saw that. Yeah, it wasn't even until recently that I knew it was a John Carpenter movie. I think when I was doing research for this project a couple of years ago. I honestly didn't know if this was one we were going to be able to watch because it was actually pretty obscure for a long time. But they finally have it out on DVD. Yay! Question mark. <laughs> the original novel for Memoirs of an Invisible Man, which I think I'm just going to call Memoirs because Memoirs of an Invisible Man is hard to say, debuted in 1987 and is to date the first and only novel written by H.F. Saint. And the way that I heard it was he had like three other novels planned, but then managed to sell the film rights for like a huge amount and just retired in the tropics somewhere. As you do. And the rights for it were quickly snatched up by Chevy Chase, who, after a string of successful comedies, which in the 80s were successful in the 90s not so much by the time this film got made, was looking for an opportunity to act in something more dramatic. The first writer to take a stab at it was the legendary William Goldman, who wrote Princess Bride, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, Marathon Man, and a heap of other great works. Seriously, he's one of the top writers in the industry. Just look up his stuff regardless. Sadly, all of his drafts were rejected for focusing too much on the comedy angle, and aside from some restructuring of the plot, very little of his work actually did make it to screen. 
The writing then shifted over to Robert Collector and Dana Olson, who both stuck with the film until its release. This is their only collaborative work in otherwise disparate careers. Robert Collector wrote and directed a pair of women in prison exploiters, Jungle Warriors and Red Heat, the one with Linda Blair, not the one with Arnold Schwarzenegger, and a girls basketball drama, Believe in Me. Dana Olson got his start writing for Laverne and Shirley, then wrote the comedies It Came From Hollywood, Wacko, and The Burbs, as well as the George of the Jungle and Inspector Gadget movies. And most recently is the co-creator and producer of the Nickelodeon series Henry Danger. So yes, when you want to make this film more dramatic, you get the guy who wrote George of the Jungle and Inspector Gadget. Just imagine I'm making that face that the girl makes when you find her in the closet in the ring. <laughs> the jaw, gape, head tipping forward, yeah. Yeah, that, just, I'm doing that. Yeah, I know a lot of these words, but what you're saying doesn't make sense. Well, now here's the interesting bit. The initial director on the project was Ivan Reitman. Yes, I did hear this actual tidbit and yeah. uh, was quite shocked. He wanted to focus more on the comedy and clashed with Chevy, who wanted to focus more on the drama. And it got to a point where Ivan literally gave Warner Brothers an ultimatum. It's either Chevy or me. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately for Reitman, Ghostbusters 2 had just come out. So the studio went with Chevy. Uh, okay. I like Ghostbusters 2. I do too, but it was considered a bomb at the time. Yeah. And Reitman instead went on to make Kindergarten Cop. I like Kindergarten Cop. I, I liked too. Kindergarten Cop. <laughs> I like Kindergarten Cop better than this. It's worth pointing out that in these early 90s, Chevy's career kind of slumped. But in the 80s, at the time this project was being greenlit, he was still riding off of, you know, the vacation movies, Fletch, mm -hmm. Spies Like Us, Three Amigos. He was huge, yeah. Yeah, so he was still a pretty hot property. And then it's like, unfortunately, by the time this film got made... Not so much. Yeah. No. And after Reitman left, Richard Donner spent a while attached to the film, and he was the one who brought in Collector and Olsen to do the rewrite of the script. I have one of the drafts that they wrote for Donner, and I will have things to say about it throughout the episode. It's, most of that script actually did stick around, but there's a few very significant differences that I'll talk about. Anyways, Donner was coming off of Scrooge and Lethal Weapon 2 at the time, and when he left, he made Radio Flyer, which is a movie that I remember very strikingly from watching when I was a kid, but I keep forgetting that that was by Richard Donner. But speaking of slumps, John Carpenter had found himself in a slump around this time. His big studio films of the 80s had underperformed and were just starting to build their cult followings. While his low-budget indies Prince of Darkness and They Live didn't exactly bomb, they also didn't do particularly well at the box office. They only made like $14 million total. He was lined up to do Shadow Company, an action flick written by Shane Black and Fred Decker. Oh my god. Then Pincushion, a post-apocalyptic drama by the writer of Dragon the Bruce Lee story. Mm. But sadly, neither were able to find funding and ultimately fell apart. While John had sworn off working for the big studios after they had sworn off working for him, he was ultimately made an offer, and since there was a four-year stretch there where he wasn't able to get a movie made, he signed on to direct this. And as it was a for-hire job, John didn't really have most of his usual crew with him. The score was the big breakout for conductor Shirley Walker, who had previously done Ghoulies. Go, oh, Shirley! And the same year this movie came out, she became the head composer of Batman the Animated Series. I was gonna say, yeah. Yeah. And she kept going with Batman, Batman Beyond, I think Superman. She also did the entire Final Destination franchise, and then sadly passed away suddenly in 2006. Oh, I didn't know that. That's really sad. Oh. Yeah. I'm going to listen to the Mask of the Phantasm soundtrack in her honor. And cinematographer William Fraker had shot dozens of films, including Rosemary's Baby, Bullet, 1941, War Games, Space Camp, Honeymoon in Vegas, and Street Fighter before passing away in 2010. The few names returning from Carpenter's past films, we got stunt coordinator Jeff Amata, and this is the last film edited by Marion Rothman, with whom John had previously worked on Christine and Starman. And also, did everyone else spot Donald Lee from Big Trouble in Little China as the cab driver? Sure did. Yes. I didn't, but yay, I love that movie. <laughs> Memoirs was released on February 28th, 1992, where it opened at number two behind Wayne's World. And the next weekend, Lawnmower Man and Once Upon a Crime opened, dropping Memoirs to number seven, then to number 13 with the release of My Cousin Vinny. And by its fourth week, Basic Instinct came out, and Memoirs no longer appears on the top 15. Hmm. So ultimately, it pulled in just a domestic gross of $14 million against a budget of $40 million. So it was a pretty rough bomb. <laughs> and John, in interviews, has said that he has many stories to tell about the making of this movie that he will never tell because it was a very rough experience with a whole lot of weird shit that went down. Mm. But he's still kind of proud of how the movie turned out. So I guess we'll get to in just a second as to whether or not we agree with him. 
Nick Holloway is a successful stock analyst who nonetheless leads a very unfulfilling life as he avoids connections and keeps his relationships loose. His latest fling is with Alice Monroe, which might lead to something more, but then Nick has the worst day of his life. Hung over while at a shareholders meeting for magnoscopic laboratories, Nick sneaks away and finds a sauna in which to nap, completely oblivious as the lab's computer shorts out, leading to an evacuation and meltdown. With a flash of white light, half the building completely vanishes. It's still there, just invisible. And waking up in an invisible room in invisible clothes, Nick finds that he himself is also invisible. Initially calling for help from the authorities and emergency responders outside, Nick panics when he realizes the CIA task force led by David Jenkins has less than noble intentions for him. As the remainder of the building flashes into invisibility, it creates a further panic which Nick uses to escape. Nick doesn't really have anywhere to go, anyone he can turn to for help in his current condition, so he holds up at home until Jenkins tracks him down. Narrowly escaping agents armed with infrared goggles and trach darts, Nick aimlessly wanders the streets, learning the ghostly existence of being surrounded by people who don't know he's there. Nick tries eking out an existence at his men's club, but after a confrontation at Jenkins' office reveals just how ruthless the man is, and an appeal to the lead scientist at Magnoscopic leads to the man's death, Nick skips town to a friend's upstate beach home which has been abandoned for the season. Nick settles into a comfortable if solitary existence and even works out a plan to use his stock knowledge to start raising a new income when his friend suddenly crashes the pad for a group date weekend. Among them is Alice, who Nick again finds himself falling for. After saving her from assault by a ridiculously deep-voiced man, Nick calls her away to a neighboring home where he reveals himself and his condition. Clearing out after Jenkins once again catches the scent, the two hop a train to Mexico, but Jenkins continues the chase, capturing Alice after Nick leaps into a river. Nick records his memoir on a videotape and threatens to send it to both the press and Jenkins' superiors, who have started clamping down on the increasingly unstable and obsessed agent. Jenkins agrees to a swap with Alice, but when Nick pulls a fast one on him, Jenkins flies into a rage and brutally chases down Nick, who keeps running into things which won't let him remain invisible. It all leads to a confrontation on a rooftop, where Nick tricks Jenkins into walking off the ledge to his death below. With Alice at his side and the government washing their hands of any further pursuit, Nick moves to Switzerland, where nobody questions a person bundled head to toe in winter gear. Alex, do you recommend Memoirs of an Invisible Man? No, I certainly do not. I found it more tonally inconsistent than a Tyler Perry film. Oh, snap! <laughs> <laughs> I could not find a single fingerprint of John Carpenter's on this movie, aside from some body horror imagery and some general competency. Technical skills. Technical skills, yeah. But other than that, I found it to be a pretty empty spectacle with some pretty good effects in certain places for the time. But other than that, it's just like full of special effects and jokes signifying nothing. Julia, do you recommend it? Yes. I liked it. Shocker. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> I concur that it was a bit of a slog and a bit dry in parts, but I think there was enough good in there to recommend it. Yes. We'll get to that later. Yes. Evie, do you recommend the movie? I do, question mark. <laughs> this is one of those movies where I'm like, there is a good movie in here. But then every time you think that's going to happen, it goes, oh, no, now we're going to go here. It's almost like the most frustrating movie I've watched because it could just be like, catch me if you can, but with like an invisible guy. And it's not. And there's a sexy lamp. And I like Daryl Hannah, but she's a sexy lamp. So I kind of, someone remake this, basically, is <laughs> that's my recommendation for this movie. Someone remake this and make it good. But you hate remakes. Not all of them. <laughs> I know, I'm just. I do recommend it too, but it's not a great movie. It's not a particularly carpentery movie. There's a lot of it where it just kind of feels underdeveloped, like they just didn't quite know where to go with it and kind of wander around until they kind of find somewhere to go with it. But I did enjoy it. I did enjoy watching it. I think also part of the problem is the leads lack chemistry. Mm. Yeah. But I did enjoy it. I did enjoy watching it. It was one of those ones where I didn't feel bored. I didn't regret watching it, even though it didn't particularly do anything for me beyond just kind of mild entertainment. But it was competently made, competent cast, competent writing. The effects are actually really well done and clever in terms of how they show like every variant you can on an invisible person. Until you get to the black face. <laughs> Brown face. Brown face. Thank you. It could have been better, but it's also not bad. I don't think it's a bad film. It feels like a for hire movie. It does. But it's not bad for that. Well, why don't we just start with Chevy Chase as Nick Holloway? 
I found him serviceable, but not engaged. He's bringing that usual acerbic, detached Chevy Chase, which does suit mm-hmm. the character. But I didn't feel like he was bringing, like, his Caddyshack game, like the smarmy Chevy Chase we're used to. I think he was going for something that he was trying, like, as you were saying, he was transitioning into more dramatic roles. So I think he was definitely keeping that top of mind as he was doing that. And I think his performance suffered because of it. Because he was kind of towing the line between the two sides, and it kind of suffered for that. Yeah. My main issue is, I know one of his big things is he wanted to focus on the loneliness of Nick. Mm. And while I get that to a degree, it still feels like such a small part of the movie that I would have liked to have seen more of the dramatic side. Because a lot of it, it's just him playing an everyman and also having comedic segments. Mm -hmm. It is still a very funny movie, given that he didn't want to make it a comedy. And I think that's where I agree with you that the tone is kind of lopsided at times where there are a lot of scenes where it doesn't quite know, do I want to play this funny? Do I want to play this silly? Mm -hmm. And like, there's that great bit where he's walking around the men's club and he grabs a pair and he walks by and someone's walking by. So I got to set down the pair. But then, oh, no, they just grabbed the pair and now they're walking off with it. And it's Mm -hmm. like that could be like a heartbreaking moment where this guy hasn't eaten in like days. And this is his first time finding some food. Mm. Instead, they just kind of make it just a little do 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 type comedy sequence. I see the intentions, but I don't see them actually going there. And I don't really see anything here that Ivan Reitman couldn't have done himself. I think Ivan Reitman certainly would have boosted the comedic bits more so. Mm-hmm. Like even the small amount that they had, if they kept that small amount, they would have landed a lot more. He would have, but Ivan Reitman, he's not like one of those goofy over-the-top directors. He always mm-hmm. brings an understatement to the comedy, which is basically what you get here. I mean, like, Ghostbusters, it's very understated, very everyman. It's not, like, completely over-the-top, in-your-face screwball antics. Mm -hmm. It's, like, what you get here. Yeah. I'm a little harder on things that are almost there. Like, somewhere in the middle is usually where I come down on things. Julia, your thoughts? On Chevy Chase? On Chevy Chase. He hasn't got the range, darling. (laughs) (laughs) Says it better than I could. He hasn't got the range. He wants to have the range. He was exploring his range, and his range is actually quite small. And not where he wants it to be, but mm-hmm. he gave it a go and good on you. He tried to Bill Murray. Yeah, and you can't always do that. And that's too bad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but there it is. I don't think he's bad at the dramatic bits, but he is a bit flat. Yeah, and that's bad. That's what bad is. That's flat. why I don't like it. Because like, <laughs> yeah, where it's just so close. You're making me so mad. <laughs> <laughs> See, I think even like the parts that you were saying about the loneliness parts... The movie then kind of breaks that cardinal rule of show, don't tell, in that he's more telling me how lonely he is. I'm like, I don't really see it, though, because I didn't get to see his life before he went invisible, except for like a few minutes. So I was like, I don't know that you really have that many friends that you're missing and you have this like really great social life. If anything, we get that he was kind of invisible before. So this isn't really that big of a change. Oh, yeah. And that's actually something that goes all the way back to the book. One of the big thematic things is that he doesn't really have a life Mm. and he doesn't forge connections and he doesn't make close friends. So he literally doesn't have anyone to turn to. But it's still like you're showing us him at a dinner with friends. And I I get that it could still be alienation, but it's difficult to read into that when he's there with friends and then also making out with another person in a bathroom. That's pretty social. That's also one of the things I should mention, though. I read both the novel and the script from When Richard Donner were going to do this, Mm -hmm. which have a lot of significant differences. I'll get into that later. That's one I will point out right now. The Daryl Hannah character, they just added that stuff in the beginning just to introduce her earlier. Mm. And all the other things, she just does not come into the story until later. I mean, the novel is 600 pages long. I hate that fucking thing. <laughs> <laughs> what? That's so, I'm, I'm shocked. I thought you would loved it. She is not introduced until the last 100 pages. Wow. Oh my god. And then the Donner script introduces her in the midpoint. And this one, they give that scene up front so that they can kind of establish her earlier. Because then she really doesn't come into play until you're in the last 45 minutes of the movie. It does keep things kind of moving. Like, I appreciate it on that level. But like you said, it does kind of detract from its main thesis. And I think part of that is, in the other adaptations, like him in the men's club was supposed to be a much longer part of the story. They instead decided to move it to the beach home. And so you don't get that thing of where he's surrounded by people, none of whom he can ever interact with. Mm -hmm. It also raises the question of why doesn't he ever try to talk to the Michael McKean character? Yeah. Why doesn't he ever just try to say hello and see what happens? Because that would be too easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's also one of the frustrating things of the book is that Alice is the first character he talks to after 500 pages. And it's like, you didn't even try to talk to anyone. (laughs) 
And I think also one of the losses that I think of Nick is there was a large part of both the novel and the Richard Donner version where it's all about Nick trying to build a new identity and a new income by like trading stocks where he'll like listen in on meetings and find out which stocks to invest in all this stuff while creating these identities that he can build an income that he can then buy a new home out of that he can hide from Jenkins. They've completely cut that out of the finished film. Yeah. That's what his character is. He's a stock trader and they completely cut that out. They kind of like reference it a little bit. Yeah. But it's like, oh, let's reference it, drop plot point. Like it's completely gone. Did any of you get that he was like a stock trader from the movie? He mentioned it on the couch like that was going to be like his goal or something in the future, but they yeah, never act on it really. Like immediately jumps back and forth. That's why it was so totally inconsistent for me because him trying to start another life at a time when he should be just on the run, it just, yeah. And that's actually what was always the frustrating thing about the book too is that it's 600 pages and he never leaves New York. Oh, right. And this comes to a dead stop and it becomes more of a comedy again. When he goes to the beach house. When he goes to the beach house. And then there's also a dream sequence that amounts to nothing as well. Where he's a jazz player. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, are you just showing off that you can play piano? Is this like Dana Carvey with his drums? <laughs> and then, yeah, when he goes to the beach house, you get all the comedy of Michael McKean and his wife played by Patricia Heaton. Like you have that whole weird sex scene on the beach between them. Which was that funny. Was... <laughs> <laughs> also, like, if I were invisible, I would have been like walking away so fast. How quickly I will walk away. Yeah, he was into it. There was like a different aspect to his character where he like likes watching people have sex. <laughs> no, I do love the line where when he comes early and she's just like disappointed. He's like, ah, oh, just give me 10 minutes. Just look at the moon or something. <laughs> and then, yeah, you get that ridiculously suave and deep voiced guy who's going after Alice. He was right out of the IT crowd. Matthew Berry from the IT crowd, like, hell's bells. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like he walked in from a complete, you, you cannot have an actor like that in your movie if you're trying to be dramatic exactly because that is just so ridiculously <laughs> over the top though he did have a line that did make me laugh at the time and i don't understand it now which was it makes me think of children in the fourth of july and i don't remember the <laughs> reference to it but it made me giggle like a small child <laughs> i don't even know what that means mostly because he just had a pretty voice he does have he a did. great voice yeah it, but the voice mixed with the suave looks that hair the ascot yeah, he seems like he should be from medieval times. <laughs> or grown-up Fred Jones. He looks like he should be in a 70s variety show. That's true, yeah, I could see that as well. Or the bad guy in any 80s movie. Pretty much any 80s movie, yeah. Yeah. With a ascot on. <laughs> he was just so weird. But yeah, no, it's like as soon as you get there, it's like you could have had more dramatic exploration of him surrounded by people he can't interact with, but then he just starts stalking on Alice. Mm -hmm. And then you get the whole thing where he dresses up in the classic Invisible Man look. As you do. And even then, there's like things that they add him and Daryl Hannah go out on a date while he's wearing makeup, which I love that cute visual of he wipes his mouth and his mouth is suddenly gone. That's true, yeah. By cute, you mean horrifying and also my nightmares for the next week. Yeah, but in a good way. Yeah. It was very Lawnmower Man-esque, that scene with the sort of CGI mouth. Let's do a few more of the characters before we jump into the visual effects, because I'm sure we're going to have a lot to say about the visual effects. Mm. Well, why don't we just go ahead and talk about Daryl Hannah a bit as the love interest Alice. I'm just fresh off of Legal Eagles also with Daryl Hannah, and it's... By Ivan Reitman. <laughs> oh, is it really? I'm just like, what exactly? Because I know Daryl Hannah can commit. She's got a great physicality, and I'm not just talking about her looks. Like in Blade Runner, like as Pris and Kill Bill and stuff like that, I know she can do it. But she also has so many roles where, as Evie says, she's the sexy lamp, where she just kind of has this very dazed, dreamy voice and just kind of reacts to things. And I'm like, Daryl Hannah, I know you can do so much more. Daryl Hannah is turned on 100% of the time. She is good to go. <laughs> it's, oh, I'd love a sandwich. <laughs> uh, uh, like, she literally can't breathe out through her nose. <laughs> And it's very breathy and intense and it's all eye contact and touching and sighing and, you know, that sort of thing. She has that kind of flower child vibe to her. It's just who she was then. And like, I think Alex was disappointed because of who she became, mm. but I just don't think she was there yet. And I don't think people demanded it of her. I think they hired her for that. They were like, that's what we want. Get Daryl Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> 
And Daryl Hannah said, do that thing I do? And they said, yes. And she said, all right, then. <laughs> no, but she's like I was also saying, she's in Blade Runner, where she gives one of the most realistic death scenes since Gene Hackman. Yeah. And like Kill Bill, she's as out of type as I've ever seen her. Yeah. She's but so Kill Bill was Kill like Bill. 15, 20 years after that. Yeah. Oh, don't make me feel old. <laughs> well, then there's also Clan of the Cave Bear. I don't think I ever saw that. I know what it is, but I haven't seen it. She was also in The Little Rascals, and I loved her in that. Was she really? Yeah. She was the teacher in The Little Rascals movie. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh. But I did like Daryl Hannah's character more than I usually like characters in movies. There was little touches in there that I really appreciated. Yeah, you were saying. Yeah, like um, when he stands her up for lunch and she's sitting there waiting for him and asks for the phone and calls and finds out that he's not coming. And instead of it like destroying her world, she's just like, I'm going to have to see a menu I'm eating by myself. And that was like, does not happen (laughs) normally. It's like either she's super furious and like storms off or embarrassed or super sad. But instead, she's just like, I'm hungry. Let's get some food. (laughs) (laughs) Independent, (laughs) taking care of business. Very true. Eating in a nice restaurant, which I appreciate. Mm -hmm. Her story of her career had some holes. But I appreciated that she was not just a blonde, you know, like she had her own life and that she moved on. She went to the house with another man that she was probably being set up with, I guess, and didn't care for it. But it just wasn't like she was like, I wonder why he's still not calling. (laughs) (laughs) I love that scene with her and Richard in the room where Nick is watching and you can see her sighing and rolling her eyes as this guy keeps making move after move that she's just not interested in. And you could just tell from Nick, it's like, oh, I've done all this stuff, too. So this is how it actually feels to see it. Mm. He then follows that up by then just staring at her as she sleeps at night. (laughs) And watches her undress. So, yeah. 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 Evie, any other thoughts on Daryl Hannah from you? Like, this movie becomes really interesting if you pretend it's L Driver, who's, like, playing him, and she's going to take him to Bill, and Bill's going to use him for evil stuff. But otherwise, she is a very sexy lamp that I will give you does have that cool scene in the restaurant, but it doesn't really make up for the fact that the movie gives her nothing to do. Mm. It wouldn't have been a big loss if we didn't have the character cut out completely. Yeah. So following on that, I'll get into the novel in a bit, but with the Richard Donner draft, what it was is that she's a TV journalist. She produces segments for a news show. It's while they're together that she starts recording tapes of him, the memoirs, which we get a brief glimpse of here. And it's during the big climax, what actually helps tip the scale in Nick's favor is he calls the TV news crew to that street outside Jenkins' office. So the news crew is witnessing this. And Jenkins actually shoots the cameraman as he's just gone completely off the deep end. And all this is being caught on TV. But none of the Invisible Man is being caught on TV. It's just Jenkins going crazy and starting to shoot at people. And so that ultimately is what tips the scale. And they end up burying the story and they still run off to Switzerland. But she actually does play a much bigger role in terms of wanting to learn more about this guy's story, using her job as a way to help support the bad guy. I do miss that they cut that out. Mm. That sounds really good. That would have worked. Now, about what the novel does with her character. (laughs) She's actually a collection of like three different characters. He's dating a journalist in the beginning of the story who then we never talk to again. But then like at the very end of the book, after writing his memoirs down, he mails them to her in the hopes that they'll get out there because Jenkins is still chasing him by the end. Jenkins never goes away in the book. And then there's okay, so there's a part where Nick tries to rape a woman. Where he's at a party and sees a drunk woman wander off by herself, pulls her into a room and starts assaulting her just like Richard did to Alice in in this. And of course, then someone walks in, turns on the lights. The woman realizes she's with an invisible man and starts screaming. And I think the line was, and he ran out of the apartment and it took three stories before he couldn't hear the screams anymore. That's our hero. I'm so glad they cut that from the movie. So then at another party, he meets Alice, who starts talking about ghosts. And while she starts talking about ghosts, he decides, I'm going to fuck with this woman and starts whispering in her ear and starts touching her and groping her with hands that she can't see. And so scared, she leaves the party and he follows her down to the cab, doing this entire thing to her, assaults her while she's in the cab while going on a monologue, because the book is first person, about, you know, there's differences of consent. You know, consent doesn't exactly mean the same thing to me. So thus begins their hundred page relationship where he just tells her that he's a ghost the entire time, starts haunting her apartment and just doing things to her, gradually forcing her to do more and more things for him and convincing himself that she's in love with him. And at the end of the book, they still run off together. Written by Alan Moore. Yeah, H.S. Saint is a horrible writer. I think what we have in the movie is vastly superior. Yeah, now I'm totally recommending this A plus 14 Oscars. 
And even in the Richard Donner version, there is no beach home. What it is is his friend, instead of having a wife, tried dating Alice a few times and then she broke up with him. So he starts with nowhere else to go. He just starts kind of living in and out of her apartment without her knowing. He tries to give her as much privacy as he can, but he's also mm. using her apartment to start doing his stock deals and stock options so he has an address. It's still kind of creepy and a little stalkery, and I'm glad they cut that down and moved it to the beach house. Mm -hmm. I even love when Mike McKean gets to the beach house and realizes someone's been living there. Like, he's been using my clothes. He stalked my refrigerator. <laughs> and they actually put together who it was. And then are just assuming that he committed suicide because they're just like, whatevs. So yeah, so I was already hating the book before it got to that point, and then it got to that point. That's a real bummer. I don't even, I can't go on anymore. <laughs> and people who were following me on Twitter might remember as soon as I finished the book, I went and threw it into a lake. I do remember. And then you fished it out and you recycled it because you're a good person. <laughs> because don't pollute kids. Uh, yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> I actually took the time to glue a piece of thread into the book. Because <laughs> it's cold. I'm not going in the water. Yeah, obviously I wouldn't. But the book went in the water. I still have a picture. I'll put it in the show notes. There you go. <laughs> Oh, oh, one other thing was we had that bit where she puts the makeup on his face and I actually like that line. It's nice to finally see you and he's it's nice to finally be seen. That was a nice line. Mm. That was cute. And then I did like that they went out on the date. What's fascinating is in the book, he weirdly overthinks the invisibility and how the molecules are affected so that nothing sticks to him. So he can't put on makeup. He can't put on tape. He can't put on any kind of paint. And nor does he appear on infrared because that's mm. how this works. I like that the movie actually toned that down of, yeah, you can wear makeup, they can see you on infrared, that's actually a threat. He was trying to explain why he doesn't get covered in dust every day. That would make sense, yeah. And instead, he ends up looking like Johnny Depp in the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory remake. <laughs> yeah. And so instead, we get that date scene, which I actually thought was a very nice addition. And then, of course, we also, with the makeup, we get the brown face where he dresses up as the taxi driver. It's an 80s staple, but this is 92. Not that it was acceptable in the 80s either. If this had been made in 88. Yeah. <laughs> it was a different time, kids. It was a different time. It's very trading places. Open racism everywhere. Yeah. Well, why don't we talk about Sam Neill as Jenkins, the government agent who's after him? I have never, nor will I ever, complain about Sam Neill. I've never seen him given a performance that I said, I don't like that, Sam Neill. Stop that. I thought he was great. He's very small. <laughs> well, part of that's also Chevy Chase is an extremely tall man. Oh, no, not just Chevy Chase. He's small. <laughs> I should, I'll look up and see how tall he is. There's a scene where they're getting Chevy Chase when he's unconscious out of the building. Mm. And then they're all in the jumpsuits. And then there's tiny little Sam Neill at the end. <laughs> Because there's like four guys carrying him, having a dialogue about what to do with him, and what's going to happen. <laughs> and then I'm like, who's that little guy at the end? And then I'm like, oh, it's that's me, Sam Neill. Sam Neill. <laughs> well, according to the internet, Sam Neill is six feet tall. Wow. He looked tiny. Then how tall is Chevy Chase? Like seven feet see. tall? <laughs> He's eight <laughs> foot four. Is he just a giant? Does he tower over all of us? Yes. <laughs> He's like the Iron Giant. I always thought that Sam Neill was like maybe like 5'9 or something, but... Maybe they had him down on the street and they were walking up on the sidewalk. Maybe it's because you're used to seeing him next to dinosaurs. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> yeah, Chevy is 6'4". That's pretty tall. That is three taller than me. There's three more. But no, but the way it's shot, I've always thought of Sam Neill as a shorter man too, yeah. That's actually surprising that he's so tall. But anyways, he's terrifying. Always has been. Thanks, Event Horizon. Okay, I know Michael McKean is really tall, too, and he looked kind of short in this, too, so I don't know if it's just the way it was shot. Maybe, yeah. Am I the only person who didn't hate Sam Neill and was like, I kind of see it from his point of view? I saw it from his point of view in the book, but in the book, they didn't make him this psychotic killer like they do here. See, but in the movie, they tell you that he's a psychotic killer. They don't actually show you. The one thing that he does is he tries to stop Nick from jumping when he thinks he's going to jump. No, but he does kill Walks, the professor. Does he? Oh, God, they had a throwaway line about it or something, and I completely zoned out at that point. I was like, okay. And it's like you're killing the scientist who could make you more invisible people instead of just locking him up and making more <laughs> invisible people. Technically, he didn't kill him. The guys who work for him killed him. No, but he was killed under his orders. Oh, yeah. Oh, I just realized that, you know, his big thing was, 
oh, so are you telling me you didn't kill this person who fell off the roof of a building? And then he ends the movie by falling off the roof of a building. <laughs> yes, tricked by Nick, the other psychotic killer of the movie, who it says like Olay or something as he flies off. Olay motherfucker or something like that, yeah. <laughs> that was kind of a nice bit where he's just puppeting his jacket. Yeah, he was completely going to kill him. Like that was the intention was to get him to fall off that building. Oh, yeah. Well, the Richard Donner draft is even darker where Nick shoots him in the head and just makes him look like he killed himself. Wow. Interesting. Interesting choices, fellows. Well, if you had gone darker with the Jenkins character, I would have been okay with that. Yeah. But if the tone matched that, like, it wouldn't be as noticeable. It wouldn't stand out as much if Jenkins had also, I don't know, killed more people, been more of a threat, threatened more. But he seemed like just a overzealous bureaucrat. <laughs> yeah, and that's basically what he was in the book. It's just, this is his job. He's going to get it done. And it's almost becomes this kind of feud where Nick keeps pissing him off and he keeps pissing Nick off and they just keep one-upping each other. And it's like, I'm not going to leave you alone until you come with me. Well, I'm not going to come with you, so leave me alone. And the book just kind of ends with that still going. That's never fully resolved in the book. I do understand bumping him up. I actually like that they brought in his boss, played by Stephen Tobolowsky, who's interesting because he usually plays the scientist guy. It's neat seeing him play a military guy mm -hmm. as the guy who's like, you've gone way too far. It's done. And I love that Sam Neill always refuses to listen to his boss. Yeah. He always just brushes off his boss as though he's nobody. I always love Tobo in a role. I don't understand why he did not listen to Stephen Tobolowski, because I would, because I love that man. He's precious. He is indeed. The understanding that I got is that in the books, they were just members of the, I don't know if it's CIA or FBI, but they were just government agents. The impression I got is that him and his team are kind of private contractors, and they, they personally want Nick because they want him for their own team. They don't want him for the government. They want him for their own team. Yeah, they do that on movies a lot where they'll just have a rogue agency within a team or like a shadow operation just so that it's not really shitting on an organization like the FBI where they can kind of be like, but these guys went rogue. It's okay. It was the CIA. Oh, uh, was it? Okay. Yeah, because Stephen told me <laughs> he said he was going to call a Langley. Yeah, and that, that would be CIA. And that's where the CIA uh, is. Right, right, right. Thanks, right. Homeland. <laughs> um, <laughs> They're calling Jack Ryan. <laughs> And then Sam Neill eventually reveals that he's basically in it, basically to make money. He's going to sell it to the highest bidder of who will buy him to use as a weapon. Well, that's after he realizes he's probably going to get kicked out. Of he's, he's like, who cares? Yeah. I'll just sell to the highest Well, yeah, because it keeps going down that line because uh -huh. he never listens to Tobolowsky. It's always about him trying to get him for his own. You're right. Not even about anything else. Just, just trying to possess him so that he can use him and get money out of it. That's that's true. But then again, why did he kill the scientist? Because he crazy. I know that what created the invisibility was a complete mistake that nobody planned for, but the scientist still knows what the entire setup was. So that's, if you're going to- But then if there is no more, that makes Chevy Chase that more valuable. I know, but wouldn't you rather make one of your own team invisible, someone who's already a dedicated agent, than try to get this annoying stockbroker who doesn't know what he's doing? Yeah, that would make sense yeah. if you weren't crazy. That's true. <laughs> but also, if we keep thinking along these lines, why would they even do this since you can see him with infrared? The army's just going to get a bunch of infrared goggles. I like that they showed how poor the quality was in infrared goggles, mm -hmm. so that that doesn't really help you much. But you can still see them, kind of. They just kind really of. just need flower clouds. They just need to swing broom handles around. But all you have to do is walk into a crowd and then you can't distinguish him. I was a bit confused how he actually ended up there. I know his secretary said you promised he would go and he shows up hungover, but why was he at that conference if he was, I don't get it. They were doing a shareholders meeting. Yeah, or it was like they were going to go public with this and the stock options and something, something stocks. Something, something stocks. Sure, <laughs> sure. I'll take it. Buy, sell. <laughs> no, and it was just a complete, in the book, it was because he was dating a journalist who was covering the story at the time and he was just tagging along. In this one, it's just because it's a shareholders meeting. Did the building also get destroyed by a cup of coffee in the book? <laughs> no, they never exactly say what it is. Well, actually, let me just get into that first. What did you guys think of the effect of the building that's kind of half there, half isn't? Look cool. Yeah, I thought it looked cool. It looked very cool. Yeah, and that was a full-sized practical set on location. Oh, <laughs> I love the past. <laughs> Where they just hung up chunks of a building. No, that would not happen. <laughs> Good job, guys. No, that would not happen. They would do that all in green screen yeah. or blue screen or whatever screen's in these days. 
in both the book and the Donner version, it's just the entire building is invisible at once. Mm -hmm. And so it's the Nick character has to try to figure out his way out of an invisible building while invisible. I like the idea, well, let's just leave part of the building there just to illustrate the point that he's invisible. Mm -hmm. First with, you know, sitting at the desk, going to the mirror. Showing the audience. Yeah, it's super cool. And speaking of, I actually like that there's a lot of bits where we still see Nick, mm -hmm. where they just let Chevy perform pantomiming that he's invisible. I actually think that was very effective because then it's just not an invisible character for the entire movie. I'm sure Chevy Chase insisted on that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a star. <laughs> Definitely the Daryl Hannah scene when they're in bed. Though it would have liked a training montage because at one point, like, he's terrible at invisibility and then he's just good at it. I'm like, I just want, like, a Rocky style training montage of where he gets better at invisibility. Well, and that's where the book helped being 600 pages long and also heard it by being 600 pages long because <laughs> it gets into that. Like, there's an entire, I want to say, 40 page chunk of the book where he's just figuring out what he can and can't eat. Because you get that one scene where he can see his stomach and he throws up. Mm -hmm. Basically, as food digests, it starts to merge with his particles so the food starts to become invisible. But it's just him learning which foods can and which foods can't. Because I think there's still a line in the movie where he is ordering food and he's like, now which food is the most clear? Which is the most transparent? Yeah, there is. So can he see his body form its own poop and then poop it? Or does his no. poop become invisible? As the food digests, it becomes invisible. Then what's the problem? You can't just live on clear Pepsi, man. Depending on the food, it takes longer to do that. Like, I think you said eating meat, it'll take mm. a few hours to do that. And even then, if there's while, any yeah. gristle, the gristle will not fully, because the gristle can't absorb anything. Makes the gristle sense. will still remain partially visible until it comes out. Glass noodles forever. And stuff like that. Or like if he eats a bone, you know, the bone's not going to fully absorb mm -hmm. the juice. I, I think it's just as it absorbs the juice of his stomach, mm. then it becomes more and more invisible. I just think you should wrap a towel around his body. Well, and that's just it. They dropped the line where when Alice was like, so what does it look like when you eat? And he's like, trust me, you don't want to know. That was a great line from the early script that I wish they had kept because you get the bit where he's eating while talking to her and he just has the bed sheet tied up all over his torso. Mm -hmm. I really liked how they did the effects of how they didn't just stick to like one effect. They used everything they had in terms mm -hmm. of like, let's show him visible and pantomiming. Let's have stuff hanging from strings. Let's have green screen. Let's have puppets. I should point out that the effects for this were done by ILM, and this is where they first developed a lot of the techniques that they then used in Forrest Gump. Not to go back on the negative train again, but that does kind of lend itself to my whole tonal inconsistencies thing, because when he's feeling really sad, it kind of gets counterbalanced by the fact that he's occasionally in full jogging gear running down the beach, invisible. And then you have by a fisherman who just doesn't notice him. Yeah. Because <laughs> you're trying to lie low. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know quite why they did that. But I should point out that, you know, this is one of the first movies to use a lot of CGI, mm. where it's using green screen to remove things, but then it's using CGI to fill in the gaps of what's not visible like right. when he has the makeup on his face but you see it from behind or whenever you see an open collar or stuff like that so there is a lot of early cgi in this movie definitely lots of cool effects for sure and then, of course like there's a scene where he's smoking why was he smoking that was weird i think they just wanted to illustrate it that bothered me <laughs> i just needed something to set that up you he's know a shock out. or something yeah. stressed out because he didn't smoke a single time before that oh my or stars after. and garters i need a cigarette yeah <laughs> but then all of a sudden just had this random cigarette that's something that they could have done as an earlier effect in the movie or like daryl hannah smoked and then was like i need to be able to see you so they like did it so that they could have a conversation and she knew where to put her eyes and she just blows smoke in his face that'd, that'd be, be amazing cool. <laughs> that would be cool yeah and i think they said the hardest effect to achieve and they actually had to invent some computer technology to do it is just that one brief moment of him throwing up oh, oh yeah ilm developing technology for chevy chase throwing up while in his <laughs> i'm sure they had a very good time yeah <laughs> I like how varied it is in, in the depictions that they use. Well, that's why you go to the see an invisible man picture to see all the cool invisible man effects. Yeah, and this wasn't topped until The Hollow Man starring Kevin Bacon. <laughs> Which is, of course, the greatest. Actually, I've never seen. I can't even joke about it. This is a better movie than The Hollow Man. I'm sure it is. Hollow Man's just icky and gross. Yeah, I've heard tell of things. Hollow Man is basically everything they cut out of the book. Yay! But it has Kevin Bacon, so... The main frustrating part of the book, which I kind of got to, is not only is it a reprehensible lead and it just takes some really awful turns, but everything in the book takes so fucking long to happen. Like, the mm. bit where he wakes up in the building and finds himself invisible to the part where he escapes the building, the first building that he woke up invisible in, is 120 pages long. 
of just him wandering around an invisible building, putting a situation together, all the agents trying to find their way into an invisible building <laughs> that's also on top of an invisible crater. Meanwhile, after Nick figures out that he doesn't trust these people and he wants to get away from them, while they're trying to find him, he's basically gathering up as many things as he can, invisible objects that he can take with them, including an invisible gun, an invisible stapler, invisible pillow cushions, invisible <laughs> galoshes. He, like, rounds up 300 pounds worth of stuff wrapped up in four tablecloths. It's like the start of a Zelda game. <laughs> Then there's 50 pages of him trying to figure out how to escape while carrying this stuff with him. He's literally like taking tables and desks out of the office in order to stack them so that he can get over a fence that's been built around. Fascinating. <laughs> Just so he can transport these four massive sacks of invisible stuff. <laughs> And then once he gets all that invisible stuff out, he then takes it all to a person's garage because he steals a car and has to try to get through roadblocks while being an invisible man in a car, and then stashes them in a friend's summer home outside of New York, and then does not revisit any of that material, except for the gun. The gun plays a part throughout. He doesn't get any of that material until the last 50 pages of the book, where he's like, my suit's falling apart. I need to use all the invisible fabric I have to make new clothes. You found the stapler. <laughs> and it just takes so freaking long. Does he teach himself to cook? <laughs> yeah, he does. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> I was joking. Rice noodles and bouillon cubes. <laughs> and I think clear jello, that's his diet. Ew, clear jello. What flavor is that? Pineapple? Hoof. <laughs> Hoof. <laughs> And then the whole thing of the men's club, the men's club is 300 pages of the book where he's just hiding in a men's club. That sounds fascinating. <laughs> Until it's like, you know, the various stories of we think there's a ghost in the club, get out and Jenkins finds him. And so he goes to another men's club and it goes on for another 100 pages of him in a second men's club. God, why? <laughs> sounds like this guy just wasn't invited to men's clubs. <laughs> well, I think what it is is the author is literally just, okay, where would I go if I'm invisible? Well, I would go to my men's club. Oh, God, I hope it's not right what you know from what you've described. It is. Oh, the entire book is literally right what you know, which is why he never leaves New York and only goes to the places that this lonely author ever goes to. Ay, ay, ay. Oh, my God, he has no imagination then. I would go to so many men's saunas. <laughs> I'm a monster. <laughs> Though I gotta say, the reason why Jenkins is so dead set on catching this guy, and this is Nick's own damn fault, is that when Nick is escaping from the building in the beginning, he uses the invisible gun to shoot a guy. Doesn't kill him, but like shoots him in the stomach, which you know is a horrible place to get shot. Yikes. And then, just for jollies, decides, well, I'm gonna burn the entire building down. <laughs> God. <laughs> Nick, you're the worst. While these agents are in it, and it's literally invisible, they're stuck in an invisible building that's burning with invisible flame and invisible smoke. How is the flame invisible? Because fire is just igniting the particles that are already there, and those particles are invisible. What? <laughs> A wizard did it. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say, this is some uh, Reed Richards science here. Uh, <laughs> I know. Nick is a horrible, horrible person who deserves to be caught by Jenkins. Jenkins is actually kind of a sympathetic character in the book. Yeah. He's like, we can't keep letting you run around when you are doing stuff like this. Yeah, Nick should have fallen off some invisible stairs. Yeah, I mean, it's like in the next time we see this one agent in Jenkins' office, the guy has a crutch because his knee is gone. He oh, lost okay. part of his intestines because he was shot in the stomach. Nick ruined a guy's life and almost killed four people by burning down a building just to get back at this guy. This book should have been called Invisible Hearts of Darkness. It is. Nick is a horrible person in the <laughs> book. The thing is, the movie is a vast improvement on the book. I still don't think it's a great movie, but I think if you're going to do any variation on this story, I'm fine with this one. Yeah. Of the Invisible Man movies that I've seen... This is actually the one I probably like the most. Yeah, is there actually like a good Invisible Man movie? I mean, the only other ones were there were the Universal Monster ones, uh -huh. which I think were like four or five of them. And then, you know, of course, the 80s had your raunchy teen comedies where he's invisible in the girls' locker room. The Invisible Maniac. And then there's The Hollow Man, which is just gross and depressing. Mm. I think this one is, it's a charming movie. Again, I don't love it. It doesn't blow me away, but I enjoyed watching it. I think it's a film I'd throw on on a weekend, you know? I would say that the best Invisible Man movie is still Abbott and Costello meet the Invisible Man, but that's just my opinion. I haven't seen that one, actually. They meet the Invisible Man. It's a thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, but in terms of, like, John Carpenteriness, yeah, no, I agree. There's not much here. And I think part of that is also he was walking in on a script that had already been developed. It was mostly already cast by that point. Most of the crew was already in place. Mm -hmm. He didn't have his own cinematographer. He didn't do the music. Pulling an Irvin Kirshner. 
for that, I think it's still a very well-made film on a technical level. But yeah, it doesn't have the Carpenter vibe to it. Yeah, I certainly didn't hate it by any stretch of the imagination, but I cannot in good conscience recommend it. The recommendation on this one, the scale is, if you watch it, will you regret it? No. Do you have to watch it? No. Yeah, I would say that's fair. It's not a film that I'd say people have to go watch, but if it's on, yeah, check it out. Yeah, you could do worse. Mm -hmm. I really don't think that you would be missing any touch tones in John Carpenter's career if it was a miss in your John Carpenter marathon. In your rewatch, yeah. Right. In your 78-hour John Carpenter marathon. Exactly. Yeah, no, especially not. I mean, I know that elements of this actually then did continue on in his career. He did work with some of these people again. But yeah, as a John Carpenter fan, I don't feel I have gleamed any new knowledge of John from this movie. Mm -hmm. Other than I still think he's a very capable commercial director. Mm -hmm. I mean, this does feel like a film by the director of Starman. It's just not a film anywhere near as good as Starman. All my problems are really with the script. Again, I don't think it's a bad script. I just don't mm -hmm. think it's a particularly interesting one. Mm. The character of Nick Holloway just is not an interesting character. Nor particularly likable. Yeah. <laughs> and then the relationship with Daryl Hannah, it comes in too late and they just don't really have any chemistry to develop. No. It's that old school, like, these characters are now in love because the movie said so. Yeah. It no way facilitated them being in love. It was, well, they're in love now. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I get him being hot for her. Because he's watching a naked woman sleeping at night. And that w naked woman is Daryl Hannah, so fine. But that doesn't translate to love, and her side of the relationship is just, oh, this guy who stood me up on a date just called me. He's suddenly invisible and running from the government. This is interesting. And then suddenly they're on a train to Mexico. It's so rushed. They brought her in way too late in the picture to develop that. Mm -hmm. But again, it's not bad. It's just underdeveloped. It's not captivating. But it's not also not unentertaining. There's nothing about this that moves me in a particular way, but I'm still entertained by it. Mm. And Rosalind Cho is also there. Yeah. I would have liked to have maybe built her as a character. Yeah. <laughs> that was Miles O'Brien's wife from Star Trek, right? Yeah, it was Keiko O'Brien. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Julia pointed that out to me. She's my resident Star Trek expert. She enjoys bonsai tree trimming. <laughs> and becoming a child. That was weird, but handled well, I think. <laughs> and she was also Pepe in the Freaky Friday remake. We never got to that episode, yeah. Yeah, you covered Freaky Friday for your podcast. Yeah. So now, any other final thoughts on Memoirs of an Invisible Man? I think that this movie was made five years too late. Mm. If this had been made in 88, 89, it would have still been riding the high point of Chevy's career. I think it would have been a much more commercial hit. Yeah, and just even like the tones of it, the whole thing just would have played better five years earlier. When you named what other movies came out after that, I was like, oh yeah, no, this not, no, this not a fly. <laughs> <laughs> Again, this came out when Wayne's World yeah. Yeah. and Basic Instinct... <laughs> Yeah. It's not going to happen, no. guys. But five years earlier, 92 smash is a, it. What is it? 92 is like a year before Jurassic freaking Park. Yeah. And that was right when Sam Neill broke out finally. There you go. Yeah. Building up to Event Horizon. <laughs> Stop bringing up Event Horizon. <laughs> Burn into my mind. But I mean, yeah, looking at the early 90s, what Chevy Chase was doing was nothing but trouble. Oh, God. That didn't go well. Hero, Cops and Robertsons. Nope. All forgettable, like, rainy day to cottage movies. It just sounds to me like they're scripts that were written in the 80s that got put on hold, and then they revisited them in the 90s, decided to put in Sony Walkmans, yeah. <laughs> and say that it was updated because they were Discmans. <laughs> yeah, but again, looking at the run-up to when this was originally going to be made in 88, you had Vacation, European Vacation, Fletch, Fletch 2, Three Amigos, Spies Like Us. It's like this would have been a nice tail end of that. Yeah, this would have fit there. Unfortunately, it came out right when his career had fallen in the dumps. Again, this was the first movie Carpenter made in four years. Mm. And from what I hear, a lot of people did not enjoy working with Chevy Chase, and sometimes things can dry up in that respect. Yeah, I'm betting that that's part of the stories that John doesn't want to tell about the making of this movie. Yeah, I yeah. have a feeling. Yeah, and again, it's like John, you know, they live was a film that we loved because he poured so much of himself in that and then to go from that to a four-year stretch of nothing and then this yeah yeah and again this is not a bad movie but it is definitely a step down I, again i think part of that's just because it was a four higher thing that 
It had been so long since he made a movie, he just wanted to make something, so he jumped on this production late in the game. Did a very competent job of it, but it doesn't feel like a film that he's passionate about. Mm. Again, it doesn't feel like a film he's bringing much of himself to. Yeah. Right after this was Body Bags. We'll get to that one. Mm -hmm. See if that changed. What's Body Bags? Funny you should ask. (laughs) So, Alex, any last thoughts? Uh, no. I mean, it's fine. If you've got nothing else to do, like if there's a VHS copy of this movie and like a bat with a nail in it, just put this on. <laughs> bat with a nail? That's the best I can Wait, think of. Wait, no, I'm watching this bat. Tell me more of this bat with a nail in it. Well, it's pink and <laughs> it's sparkly. A sparkly pink bat with a nail in it. Are you okay, Alex? I'm working on the fly, okay? I'm on a lot of cold medication. <laughs> I've been working long hours at the paper mill. <laughs> So, Julie, any final thoughts? <laughs> that sums it up better than I do. <laughs> you people voting for this. <laughs> do you still recommend it as a early 90s, late 80s movie? Yes, I do. I just can't help it. I think it's in my blood or something. It's Julia Chow. If I it's could Julia pinpoint, Chow. there's a certain can't. time in moviedom where I'm just like, that is a movie Julia wants to watch. Yeah, And that's a perfectly valid feeling. Because, again, yeah, looking at it as a John Carpenter movie, no. But yeah, if you want just kind of a light early 90s Chevy Chase comedy, get to see some cool effects. Yeah, why not? I will say we would like because we watched it in two mm. parts. The first time we watched it, I was like phone down paying attention. You know why? <laughs> why? Because it's not frantic. You hate frantic movies. I just like a nice comedy. Nice guy. even keel. <laughs> I can't help it. Which is what you get with John Carpenter. <laughs> I don't think John Carpenter will ever do anything that's zany. And it was so familiar and comforting and like, mm-hmm. so I liked all of that. And then the second half was tough because it was a bit of a slog and it got weird and there was a lot of problems with it, but I would still recommend it. But I definitely stand by the idea that I do not recommend it as a John Carpenter movie. Mm. It's not something that's necessary if you're like, oh man, I love that John Carpenter. What movie should I watch? And like, well, not this one. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to retract what I said was I just said John Carpenter doesn't do zany. I forgot this is the guy who did Dark Star and Big Trouble in Little China China, and they live. Yeah, his version of zany. They're still pretty calm. I don't think Big Trouble in Little China you can ever describe as calm. That's true. (laughs) But it is awesome. That is also true. How did you get up there? Wasn't easy. I will say that there's one really good scene. I do like it when Sam Neill realizes that he's in the room with him. I like that scene a lot. That was a good scene. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, what's interesting is that in the Donner version, that scene is the lead up to the climax. Oh, is it? That makes sense. So that scene happens, I want to say, in the last half hour, whereas in this one, that's the midpoint, what leads him to leave town. Uh, Okay. I'm not saying it's better or worse. It's just kind of an interesting juxtaposition between where the directors wanted to put it. I think that scene was where I got on board with Sam Neill, and I'm like, well... Yeah, I mean, if you could assassinate Hitler with an invisible guy, you should totally do it. Absolutely. I also love Sam Neill pantomiming, having his arm yanked behind his back and a gun at his head. <laughs> yeah. Where he's literally just limboing with a gun that's been glued to his head. <laughs> There's a lot of good pantomimers in this, I will say. A lot of good stunt people falling down, the guy uh, swaying into the cab, kind of like floating into the cab. Oh, God, they had the cab scene. Yeah, that was pretty good. Where he's just puppeting this guy poorly, very poorly. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And the cab driver can't care less. <laughs> yeah, he's just like, whatever. <laughs> I've seen worse. So, Evie, any final thoughts from you? It really needed more Rosalind Cho. That is, they got nothing else. <laughs> I love that we're all super bummed out at the end of this. <laughs> well, I mean, and that's just the thing is that while it's a competent movie, it's entertaining, it's watchable, there's just not much to it. It doesn't have a point of view, really. That's ultimately the problem is that it was torn between do we make it a comedy or do we make it a drama? And they made something that never fully falls in. I mean, it's more comedy than it is drama, but none of the comedy is hysterical. None of the drama is gripping, but it's all fine. It's a fine movie. That's about all I can say. It's fine. It just doesn't feel like it's really aiming any higher than just being an entertaining movie. Mm -hmm. I mean, for all of its stories, no, this is not an acting tour de force for Chevy Chase. His most dramatic moment is when he's laying alone on a pool table Mm -hmm. with the voiceover narration. Oh, I could have done without the voiceover narration. You want to see the best of Daryl Hannah? There's others. If you want to see the best of Chevy Chase, there's others. That's true. Sam Neill in just two years will be doing In the Mouth of Madness. Oh, yeah, he comes back. Again, I think you said the year after this, he's got Jurassic Park. Yeah. Everything in this film, I think, except Chevy Chase, went on to bigger and better things. 
Chevy Chase had already run his prime. Though he did do Community eventually. Yeah, but would you say that Chevy Chase was in his prime in Community? No, but he was funny because he didn't get it. That was the best part of him in Community is that he very (laughs) obviously does not get the joke. Chevy Chase is just kind of sad to see these days. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, Carpenter, even though he's on a downswing in his career, will still do better things. Daryl Hannah will still do better things. ILM will follow this up by doing Jurassic Park and Forrest Gump, so they did much better things. Stephen Tobolowski did Groundhog's Day, which was a much better thing. That man is working 24-7. And what's funny is that in Philadelphia Experiment, Stephen Tobolowski was part of the government group who's chasing the lead hero down. And here he is again in another John Carpenter-related film as part of the <laughs> government chasing him down. Because that's what you expect from Stephen Tobolowski. Damn straight. That's what he does. I think that wraps up our episode for Memoirs of an Invisible Man. I don't really want to say anything else about the book. No, I'd say leave that in the memory. It sounds horrible, and it, why? Just why? It's been drenched and thoroughly recycled by this point. Yeah, we're going to total recall you so you forget that. Oh, wait, no, total recall means you remember it. Oh, whatever. We just recorded an episode for posterity. <laughs> <laughs> like, I love how he thinks putting an invisible man on camera is going to convince anyone that there's an invisible man. Exactly. <laughs> Look, there's no strings. I did like the effect of him chewing the gum, though. That was nice. That That's was, true. Yeah. But in this post-David Copperfield world, no one would believe that. Put that up on YouTube. That's true. Anyways, I think that wraps up our episode. Thank you for joining us again, Evie. It's been a pleasure recording with you again. (laughs) (laughs) Why did I laugh? Once more into the breach. (laughs) I think you might have misread my pause before pleasure. I meant that sincerity I was trying to stress. (laughs) I know. know. It was just such a weird movie. (laughs) Hey, this was better than Philadelphia Experiment. I'm glad you weren't on that one, actually. <laughs> see, now I want to go see it. Oh, please do. You could have been on Halloween 5. And then immediately, like, text you, like, why did you let me watch that? Follow it up with Philadelphia Experiment 2, which is a much better movie. There was a 2? There was a 2. There was also a 2012 remake by The Asylum. You had me at Asylum. <laughs> which also co-stars Michael Pere, the star of the original The Philadelphia Experiment. <laughs> How many transmorphers are in this movie? Many. Two. <laughs> Julie and Alex, thank you again. No problem. No problem. And we will be back next time with Body Bags. Body Bags. What's Body Bags? Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklocke.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. God, I, I'll have so much to say on the novel. I'll try not to bog everyone down on just getting into the novel. Is it just going to be a lot of hysterical crying from you on when it comes to the novel? <laughs> Possibly. But I'll occasionally lurch out reasons for why I'm hysterically crying. <laughs> Let me just make sure I get all the web pages open. Don't need the Point Break remake page open anymore. Yes, we were having a spirited conversation about the Point Break remake. Amazing. Did either of you watch it? No. No. Nope. Okay. <laughs> it looks awful though, right? All right, anyone have anything they need to bring up before we start? No, I'm good. Okay. I like cheese. Yay. I thought I'd just put that out there <laughs> for everyone. What specific kind? All of them, mm. but cheddar. Okay. Like cheddar is my number one, and then like brie, Swiss, Gouda, Blue. It's a long list. I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> just, just do like... We'll just stick to the top five. I need to do a podcast where I just list cheeses. Oh, just a reminder, Alex and Julia... This episode takes place before our body bags episode, so just try to mentally keep that in check that we're not bringing body bags into the discussion because we haven't talked about it yet. So, okay. Pretend we haven't watched body bags. Gotcha. What's body bags? (laughs) That's the one we watched last week. With the uh, uh, garage horror. I see. (laughs) Oh, I got me too. It was true on both levels. That's true. (laughs) It was that actually you weren't pretending. (laughs) 